Hey, good morning, everyone. Really good to see you again. I'm Anne Marie Green alongside Vladimir Dutier. Uh, Vlad, we are starting a new week, but uh, the fallout from last week continues. Um, there are many, many people asking for the president to leave the White House, even though he really only has, uh, you know, a little over a week left in his term. Uh, the likelihood of resigning is pretty low. There is talk of the 25th Amendment. There is talk of impeachment. And even beyond that, there is talk of whether or not what we witnessed on Wednesday is deserving of criminal charges. Um, you know, 2021, boy, it's really turning out to be a doozy so far. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the other thing, Anne-Marie, that I keep thinking about, and we were talking about this a little earlier on our editorial call, is when something of this magnitude happens in this country, uh, normally there are briefings given to the American people by in officials from the Department of Justice, mm -hmm. from the FBI. Uh, we've not heard anything. I mean, I think it's kind of remarkable that we were all sort of in shock uh, last week when the events unfolded on our screens uh, as we were covering it, um, either here from an anchor desk or in the thick of it, like some of our correspondents. And I think only now, as more information is dripping out through reporting and through video evidence that we're receiving, are we starting to understand the magnitude of what occurred last week? And we aren't getting any Inf uh, any bits of information from the people who are supposed to inform us about what is going on. Uh, I don't even think that people yeah. understand how much of a th threat our lawmakers and the vice president of the United States were facing as those insurrectionists uh, overran the Capitol. So we're going to ask a lot of questions to the people we talked to this week. And as you say, Anne-Marie, House Democrats are ramping up their efforts to oust President Trump from office after that deadly assault at the U.S. Capitol. Lawmakers are set to vote on a measure today aimed at pressuring Vice President Mike Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. If that fails, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she will move forward with impeachment nine days before President-elect Joe Biden takes office. President Trump is accused of inciting violence and egging on his supporters at the Capitol last week. Democrats and even some Republicans say he is unfit to serve. Nancy Cordes takes a closer look at the latest developments. I mean, does it actually make sense? Well, I like the 25th Amendment because it gets rid of him. He's out of office. In her first interview since Wednesday's attack on the Capitol, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told 60 Minutes there are multiple avenues to hold President Trump accountable. This president is guilty of inciting insurrection. Uh, he has to pay a price for that. Nearly every House Democrat has now signed on to the three-page impeachment resolution, accusing the president of inciting an insurrection. We're going to the Capitol. That means if it comes up for a vote this week, it is very likely to pass. Donald Trump may be in the Twitter penalty box, but he still has access to the nuclear codes. That's a frightening prospect. House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn suggested that if the article of impeachment passes, Speaker Pelosi could hold off on sending it to the Senate. Let's give uh, President-elect uh, Biden uh, the 100 days he needs to get his agenda off uh, and running. And maybe we'll send uh, the articles uh, sometimes after that. It's unclear if a second impeachment would be more successful in the Senate this time. But two Republicans are calling on the president to step down. Alaska's Lisa Murkowski and Pennsylvania's Pat Toomey. Well, I think the best way for our country, Chuck, is for the president to resign and go away as soon as possible. Many Republicans, eager to avoid a tough vote, insist impeaching President Trump will just fan the flames. This is a heated political moment. We've got to be able to bring volume down. Some of the strongest opposition comes from Republicans who led the charge to baselessly contest the election results. I do not see how that unifies the country. Those Republicans are now facing internal condemnation from some of their own GOP colleagues. They did it either to save their own political skins or to make a quick fundraising buck. Nancy Cordes is joining us now from Capitol Hill. So, Nancy, let's just start with, you know, what's going to be happening today. Take us through what we can expect as the House ramps up its impeachment efforts. Sure. So the House is in pro forma session today, which means House members aren't really here. Uh, the, usually the House would just be gaveled in and then gaveled out again. But they're going to introduce this uh, resolution to 
demand that the vice president invoke the 25th Amendment. And they're going to try to pass it by something that's known as unanimous consent. That requires that all House members essentially agree to this amendment. There's likely to be an objection from at least one House Republican. It's very difficult to pass things that way, as you can imagine. And so what will happen next is that Speaker Pelosi will call the entire House back to Washington to vote tomorrow on this 25th Amendment resolution, basically calling on the vice president to declare the president unfit for office so that he can be removed during his final week in office. Now, the White House is raising all kinds of objections to this, saying that there just isn't enough time. Um, but basically, what House Democrats plan to do is call the vice president's bluff. If he doesn't have anything to say in response to this amendment passing, and we do believe that it is going to pass. Uh, it has a near unanimous, if not unanimous, Democratic support. I anticipate some Republicans will pass it as well. Uh, then we move on to plan B, and that is an impeachment resolution, which could come up for a vote on Wednesday, maybe Thursday, and I anticipate that too will pass. President Trump, if this vote happens, will be impeached a second time because last I checked, 210 Democrats had already signed on as co-sponsors. It only takes about 215 to pass it, and keep in mind there probably will be some Republicans who vote yes as well. Hmm. All right, Nancy, as we saw in your report, Congressman Jim Clyburn says he wants to wait 100 days after President-elect Biden takes office to impeach President Trump so that the process does not interfere with Mr. Biden's legislative agenda. Uh, Congressman Adam Schiff spoke about this on CBS this morning earlier. Let's play some. My feeling is if we impeach him this week, that it should be immediately transmitted to the Senate and we should uh, try the case as soon as possible. Mitch McConnell has demonstrated when it comes to uh, jamming uh, Supreme Court justices uh, through the Congress, he can move with great alacrity when he wants to. Uh, and if he chooses not to, if he chooses to delay, or if some of those that were supporting uh, this challenge to the electors, this baseless challenge, uh, object to moving forward, then it's on them what this president may do between now and Inauguration Day. But I don't want that on my conscience. So Nancy, uh, Adam Schiff is probably right, but he also knows Mitch McConnell. And you know Mitch McConnell, having reported on him over many, many years. Any chance that uh, while he's still uh, the leader in the Senate, he's going to bring this up before President Trump's term ends? I mean, if it gets sent to him, then he has no chance because the Constitution says that if the House impeaches the president, then the Senate needs to take up that article for an impeachment trial right away as soon as the article or articles are sent from the House to the Senate. The point that the majority leader has been trying to make is that the Senate doesn't come into session again until January 19th, one day before President-elect Biden gets sworn in. So uh, the leader is essentially saying, look, we can't wrap up a trial before President Biden takes office. And at that point, won't Democrats want uh, to be able to focus on confirming the president's cabinet nominees? Uh, won't they want to be able to focus on his agenda rather than holding a, a Senate trial? The problem for Democrats is there is a bit of mixed messaging here, as you pointed out by playing uh, one soundbite from, from Adam Schiff and another point of view from James Clyburn. On one hand, they are arguing that the president poses such a dramatic threat to the nation that they need to hold an impeachment vote right away. They need to bring the House back to do this. They need to hold a vote as soon as possible, not even uh, looking at any evidence in committees, just hold the vote, do it. On the other hand, you have some Democrats arguing, but then we should really wait to hold a trial, um, which is really the mechanism by which you actually do remove a president. You can't remove them unless you get have a trial with a two-thirds vote in the Senate. They're saying, let's hold off on that trial, maybe for a few months to give President-elect Biden time to get his cabinet confirmed and the like. So there is some tension between those two arguments. And I think you're seeing an internal debate among Democrats. And certainly the Biden team is weighing in on this as well. You're seeing that sort of play out in public view. Nancy, Congressman uh, Clyburn, along with several other Democrats, have suggested that the assault on the Capitol was possibly an inside job. What are they getting at here? Where is this coming from and why is it significant? 
Well, I think we've all seen the pictures of some uh, law enforcement officers who appear to be joking around with some of the uh, rioters who had gotten into the Capitol building, taking selfies with them, that kind of thing. And that has really raised alarm that perhaps this group that fomented an insurrection within the Capitol wasn't treated the same way that many other more peaceful protesters have been treated with when they have been uh, on the Capitol grounds. Um, the reason that Clyburn in particular is raising this is because he says that he has an unmarked office in the Capitol building that somehow these individuals knew to go to, to get into, to, to take electronics. He said they, le they left his ceremonial offices more or less alone, but they knew how to, you know, the, 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 the Capitol building is filled with tiny little hideaways and offices all over the place. And he's, so he's questioning how they would have known to target an office like that unless they had help from somebody telling them, uh, hey, you know, you might be interested in what's around this corner. Um, you know, obviously there are a lot of unanswered questions. And as you pointed out, part of the reason we don't have answers yet is because we have not gotten formal briefings from any law enforcement officials who were involved in trying to protect the Capitol on that day. Now, part of the reason is because some of them have resigned. The House Sergeant at Arms, the Senate Sergeant at Arms, the Chief of Capitol Police has resigned. Um, but it's not just Capitol Police. You know, we haven't been briefed by the FBI, we haven't been briefed. Um, you know, DC police have come out and spoken, but there's been this resounding silence from uh, the rest of federal law enforcement about about what was done right, what was done wrong, what they're uh, what they're looking into, what they want to improve, the the plans they're making in case uh, people like this come back again, as some are vowing they will on January 17th or during the inauguration. So that is le leading to a great deal of unease among lawmakers and their aides here on Capitol Hill. It's an excellent point, Nancy, uh, and the fact that the president of the United States doesn't have his megaphone, which is social media, um, and coupled with the lack of briefings from any law enforcement officials or from the Department of Justice, you know, gives it an eerie sense out there for a lot of people. Like, no one knows exactly what's going on. Um, and let's talk about these Republican senators, Nancy, who objected to the Electoral College results. They are facing some major fallout. We've learned several corporations have suspended donations to several of these lawmakers. Um, I find it remarkable, Nancy, two things that strike me. One is that you see a lot of these Republicans now saying, you know, President-elect Biden should seek to unify the country. These are some of the same lawmakers who, even after the events, this insurrection, as President George W. Bush called it, happened, went back to the uh, inside the halls of Congress to continue to object to the certification of the Electoral College results, as opposed to perhaps deciding to not do that, to unify the country, to use their own words. And the, the other question is that these lawmakers are also tweeting about this big tech issue, the president not being able to be on Twitter. I see Ted Cruz here retweeting something that's unacceptable, that somebody lost 20,000 followers in a couple of hours. Very little about the lives that were lost um, and what the investigation is uh, giving insight into what happened on that day. Right. I mean, I have not seen a single Republican lawmaker who voted to challenge election results say, I have remorse over that vote. I regret that vote. Uh, I regret um, adding my voice to, you know, to this, uh, uh, you know, to this cl claim that somehow the election was stolen. I, I wish I could take that vote back. I haven't heard anyone say that. And yet they're arguing that President-elect Biden should uh, call for unity and should urge House Democrats not to impeach the president of the United States. They're saying there should be unity, but at the same time, they're saying there should be no consequences for inciting a violent mob that threatened them and their own colleagues. Uh, so it is a really unusual position for the law and order party to take. And it, it, does, um, it does dampen their ability to make 
make this argument. You know, it's not just corporations, although I think that that is very significant. The fact that companies like Marriott and JP Morgan and Citibank are now saying that they are uh, taking a look at all of their donations. They're going to pause political donations to anybody who voted to contest the election results. It's also their hometown newspapers, editorial boards all across the country calling upon their own lawmakers and senators to resign. Um, but what is even more striking is that even in the wake of this insurrection, there are a couple of House Republicans who have been tweeting, essentially saying things like, um, you know, wow, there were more arrests here at the Capitol than, uh, you know, than there were for, for, for other violent instances, and basically sort of excusing the individuals who perpetrated this violence here at the Capitol. And I can tell you that lawmakers like that are coming under increasing scrutiny, condemnation, even from some of their own GOP colleagues, especially after the death of a second Capitol police officer this weekend, a very, very well-liked officer named Howard Liebengood, who, you know, I saw here in the Russell Senate office building almost every day for 10 years, who had a smile on his face, um, always had a kind word. There, uh, I, I was talking to senators yesterday who were crushed because they um, had had such warm feelings about him. And I think this is one of those situations, you guys, where as the days have gone on and what happened has really started to sink in for a lot of lawmakers, and we continue to see um, videos that are more and more gruesome of the violence that took place here, people are actually getting angrier. You know, the, the, the fever is going up, not down. And there are demands for answers, and there is a lot of frustration, and some of it is turning inward. You know, Nancy, it's an excellent point because I don't know, given the way that information is received by the American people, people choose where they get their information from and oftentimes they want what they believe parroted back to them, that there are moments, uh, there will be moments, there will be some lawmakers who don't realize the danger that they were in. Um, I, I keep thinking to the vice president. I mean, we saw the video on CBS this morning of Officer Goodman leading those insurrectionists away from that room. And you can see him in the video glancing into the room and then trying to lure the crowd away from that. He's a hero. And I, I just keep thinking, what if they had made that turn into that room? What would have happened? And I don't know that, I wonder if lawmakers are even aware of that, that, that great danger that they were in. I I don't know if you, I mean, you have 30 seconds. To <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the composure of that officer? He's got a menacing, violent crowd that he's trying to keep at bay, and yet he's not trying to physically engage because he knows he'll be overpowered. He's walking backwards up the stairs. He's radioing his colleagues to tell him where this group is going. He's looking left into the Senate chamber and then moving right because he knows that a group of his fellow officers are around the corner. Just the composure that it took to uh, to execute that maneuver. And our Grace Seegers, who was inside the Senate chamber, says this morning that the moment she texted 214 to say the Senate chamber has been locked down is the moment that those, uh, you know, that those people were rounding the corner. So every minute that that officer bought them really counted. So true. Uh, and, and, you know, BuzzFeed had an article, had an interview with them, and one of the black officers, one of the black Capitol Hill police officers said the image that was so striking to him, Anne-Marie and Nancy, is being attacked by people waving Blue Lives Matter flags um, on this assault on the Capitol. Uh, Nancy Cordes, always great to have you, Nancy. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Sure thing.